Today is Edward Clark James II, better known as Ted, state representative, Democrat from Baton Rouge, a guy who has uh, spent all of his 40 years here, went to South Boulevard, to McKinley Middle, McKinley High School, senior high school, and Southern University undergraduate in law school, and in 2011, 10 years ago, he was elected to the State House of Representatives. He's the chair of the Black Caucus, and he is a major player in Louisiana politics with a lot of years to go, a lot of miles to travel, and we're glad he's here for the first time since 2018. Representative James. Thank you, Jim, and good afternoon to everyone. I see uh, some folks that, I, I like seeing you guys, I don't, I don't miss you all. Yet. Um, the folks that, that have to camp out with us at the Capitol and um, some friends, um, some antagonizers. <laughs> but friends nonetheless. So thank you all for, for being here uh, today. And, you know, of course, we, the, I think the, the number one most important thing that is happening um, across our state, of course, is the um, continuing spread of the, the Delta variant of COVID-19. Um, if any of you uh, know my story, you know that um, I have a um, you know unique COVID experience as one of the early cases and one of those um, found himself in the hospital early on. So I um, always want to you know urge members of our community to protect themselves, protect their families. Um, and as a lawyer, I would not ask you to get legal advice from a plumber. So I, I try not to give medical advice, but I will say that the people that took care of me when I was in the hospital, um, they have urged me to get the vaccine. And if I trusted them to take care of me back in 2020 for those five days, then I will trust their guidance today. And, and that's my uh, message to each and every one of you. And I think that what's ironic about it is that uh, when I was diagnosed with COVID, it was, I think it was the, the first week that we were that the government has shut down, that the state has shut down. Um, we retired the session on a Monday, um, and the next Monday I found myself with a fever. And early on they kept telling us that it was not a disease that a young person would probably get. Um, and right now, when you look at the rising number of cases, um, the cases and the folks that are in the hospital, most of those folks are my age group. And um, I think it's a large, part of you know not being vaccinated one I think that um, we were so on um, board in 2020 that the moment things started to get back to normal we started to, to gather more and um, get out and enjoy life and those things are great if you're vaccinated but you know folks in my age group aren't um, doing their part to get vaccinated I think we're going to steadily see uh, more cases um, and it's extremely concerning for me um, as the day I, I dropped off my little four-year-old for her first day of pre-K, and uh, we're hearing so many issues with, with our young people and those um, young people that are so vulnerable and, and can't be vaccinated and, and they're in those, those classrooms. So um, I would ask that, that you uh, play your part and, and get vaccinated and encourage um, those people in your families and in your networks to, uh, to do the same. Because I, I know that I'm excited about um, Southern and LSU football. Um, disappointed that the Jazz Fest was canceled, uh, but I understand that, that those we're going to continue to see cancellations if, if we don't um, get this thing under control. So this past legislative session, and I know a lot of what I wanted to talk about um, is regarding the, the past, the first and historic veto override session, but I think that it's important um, to talk about the regular session because I, I think that we don't do enough um, to highlight a lot of the, the positive things that are happening here. And for you, um, the press club, I thank you, especially you know here in Baton Rouge, because in, in certain places, I know that there are media outlets that um, that serve more as bloggers um, and not to really put out the news. So I thank you 
because this is, you serve a very important role um, and that the folks that I represent who don't have the time to camp out at the Capitol, um, who are busy working two or three jobs, they rely on you um, to educate them on what's happening at the Capitol. So I appreciate um, the work that you do and I have always been one to try to uh, be transparent and available to the media and I know some folks um, have not exercised in, in that fashion. I think it's uh, negligent of us not to um, because you guys serve an important role and if ever um, there's an uncomfortable conversation or an uncomfortable question, um, I think that I have a duty to respond not just to you all, but I think I have a duty to respond to the people that I represent, so thank you. Uh, this past session, I believe, we uh, showed that we can actually compromise as a, as a legislature. Um, our term started um, in that Democrats uh, forged a partnership with um, some of the Republicans to elect um, Speaker Shakespeare. And that coalition has worked well outside of the, the past month or so um, to advance some very important issues in the state. And there have been issues um, that were traditionally carried by Democrats that are now carried by my Republican colleagues and vice versa. Um, we have not had a session where Democrats, especially in the caucus that I represent, the black caucus, that played a major role in tax discussions. Our focus has usually been around social issues and uh, criminal justice reform, but, but this year we um, worked extremely well with our Republican colleagues to pass on um, tax reform. And unfortunately, uh, we get unfairly put in a box that uh, Democrats don't want to see tax reform. Uh, we have um, watched year after year as a lot of the proposals um, that were passed this year were authored by many of my colleagues on the Democratic side in past years. And um, when many of you asked for us to go and get a bipartisan group um, and get us um, advice, uh, recommendations, several years ago, we, we said no to those recommendations. This year, we finally started to do what was asked of us, and we started to pass a monumental tax reform. Now, a lot of those things were upheld for um, a few weeks as we negotiated, and one of the things that um, I heard someone speaking about it earlier, um, and I've had opportunity to talk to, to Jim about this on his show, a lot of the conversations around um, you know, the former chairman of, of education were largely distractions for us. Um, those were conversations that, um, quite frankly, I didn't want to have because as chairman of the Black Caucus, we had a, a very aggressive agenda and um, that conversation, that um, incident caused a huge distraction in what we were trying to accomplish at the legislature. And it's not surprising that we, um, as Democrats, held up certain tax votes. Uh, we've done that in the past. This year, it was categorized as a response to what happened in House Education. Um, but if you look back every fiscal session, um, for those of us on, on my side, we don't have the numbers to really influence um, the debate, the agendas, when the votes are merely 53. But when there are 70 vote bills, um, that's when we can really play our part because we know that um, no matter the, the instrument, um, especially in the tax session, there are some folks on the opposite side that are just not going to vote uh, for those bills because of their philosophy, and I respect that. Um, but for us, when the speaker and the president had monumental tax issues that needed 70 votes, um, and they knew that their members wouldn't support some of those things, it was important for us um, to not only assist in making those things happen, but also um, to get some monumental tax reform um, done for working people with um, enhancing the, the earned income tax credit. Um, we were able to eliminate the sales tax on, on diapers and um, other feminine projects. We tried to do that two years ago and I was really excited then because my little girl was still in diapers so that would have benefited me too. Um, but we passed it now and she's no longer in diapers but you know it's not going to benefit me but it's definitely going to, to benefit a lot of families and especially um, those single mothers out there. Um, again criminal justice reform, bipartisan, uh, we did a lot in terms of you know police reform and a lot of times those conversations are, are very uncomfortable conversations um, but for us as a legislature, we um, didn't just rush, uh, we didn't just pass things based on emotion. We met for several months with members of law enforcement, um, from state police to um, local fraternal order of police, and, and we 
heard um, feedback, uh, we were educated, and we um, sent 18 proposals to the Louisiana legislature. And of those 18, um, 16 of those things became law. Um, and that's work that we are extremely proud of because we didn't do what we're seeing in other states. We didn't um, run to individual corners and, and not work together. Um, as much as folks uh, make these conversations really one-sided, uh, we work in lockstep to get a lot of these instruments passed. Um, and I'm extremely proud of those things. Um, access to voting in most states, you're hearing um, rolling back of, of voting rights. In, in our state, uh, we enhanced voting rights. We um, extended the time to early voting presidential elections. We extended the time um, that many of you have inside the voting booth. And for you all, of course, everyone in this one, we're, we're educated voters. We go into um, the vote booth on election day and we know exactly how we're going to vote because we researched, um, we looked at the par recommendations. You've had uh, members of the legislature attend your meetings, so you're educated on a lot of the constitutional amendments. I will tell you as someone that votes on those amendments, uh, several months later, I have to study again when people ask me, uh, what does a yes vote mean? What does a no vote mean? So I know that there are people um, in our state um, that three minutes was not long enough if we're going to ask folks to vote from the top of the ballot all the way down when we have eight or nine constitutional amendments. We felt that it was important to extend that time and we were able um, to do that. Um, nobody came out of the regular session extremely happy and I think that that is the way it's supposed to be. No one should go into the legislature and get everything that they want. Um, you know, for me being in the minority side, I, I'm grown accustomed to not getting everything that I want. Um, so, so maybe uh, my commentary is, is a bit skewed because of the, the side um, that I find myself on, but I know that the coalition that, that we were able to form um, when we elected Speaker Shea Snyder is one that has benefited us because we will see the fruits from our labor and some of the, um, the bills that we passed. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the successes that we were able to accomplish in the regular session um, were quickly overshadowed by the speaker's decision um, to rush us into this historic veto override session. Um, I've had this conversation with the governor several times. In my 10 years, that's the one thing that, that I haven't been able to do is, is override a governor. I really wanted to do it um, with a bill that Governor Jim Bill had vetoed regarding surrogacy. Um, we were really um, teed up and I, I wanted to go in and, and make that vote and I even told um, Governor Edwards, I was like, look, you're my friend, but if, if the right bill comes up, I'm gonna make the vote because quite frankly, this is the one thing that I will probably never be able to do. Um, unfortunately, the bills that, that brought us to um, the legislature weren't um, significant enough for me um, to go in and, and make that vote. Every single Democrat with the exception of one returned a ballot saying we do not see the need for a veto session. And I've heard several questions. Um, many of the Democrats voted for those bills. Many of the Democrats were co-authors of those bills. And I think that um, those members who, who voted on those bills, um, I didn't vote for either one of them, um, but I think it is incumbent upon them to go to their districts and explain um, why you voted for a bill but, but didn't support um, a process that um, is in the Constitution to override the governor's veto. I'll tell you with um, the gun bill, and let me dispel this uh, myth right now, Democrats support the Second Amendment, right? Uh, you know, I know that uh, there, there has been, um, you know, a lot of rhetoric around the fact that uh, we have um, tried to take guns away from, from folks. Um, I've never voted on a bill that would have taken a gun away from a single Louisiana resident in my 10 years. Uh, we know um, how the people of Louisiana feel about um, their Second Amendment right, and we as a party have never done that, and we, we have not done it, and this bill was simply not about um, taking away constitutional rights. I feel that this bill was about safety. Um, I also, in addition to chairing the Louisiana Legislative Black Caucus, I chair the Criminal Justice Committee. Um, I still chair the committee. I know some folks are, are asking for me not um, to chair that committee, but today as I, as I stand here, I'm still the chairman. I still have my, my wonderful parking spot uh, right outside uh, the Capitol. Um, one of the things that was largely missing was the um, opposition from law enforcement during the committee process. Um, so some members that, that voted for um, those bills in the session 
once law enforcement started to really educate us on how bad those bills would have been for their offices, um, I think that that turned the scale for many of the members who had supported um, the bill in its original form when it passed out of the legislature. When you see sheriffs across the state, state police come out and say, um, this is something that's going to put our officers in jeopardy. Uh, when you have growing rates of, of violence in our communities, I think that it's important that we um, have just the, the necessary training um, because I know that I want um, someone to understand how to use that weapon if they're going to carry. Um, I want, especially um, the folks that I represent um, as a criminal defense attorney, one of the most important things that happens in those trainings, taxpayers, Louisiana residents are educated on the laws. They're educated on how you can properly defend yourself um, because sometimes, and I know it because I've had people walk into my law office, they don't understand just because someone is on your front lawn, you cannot go and grab your gun and unload on them. Um, and those things are taught in the trainings that many of my colleagues tried to say were unnecessary. Um, I think that that was one of the major reasons that they called law enforcement to um, really unify in opposition to this bill. Now the other bill, um, I wouldn't tarnish the rep reputation of our state to support an instrument that I knew would, number one, cost us um, a large, possibly millions of dollars in revenue. Um, now, you've heard many things that, about the um, NCAA. I saw the email from the council from the NCAA. Um, so if it wasn't something that we made up, we would have definitely been in major trouble for losing that um, huge economic driver for our state had that bill passed. Um, I know that we saw it in other states. We were able to get the All-Star game because of a, a bill, a transgender bill, that was passed in North Carolina. Um, so the facts were there. There was no need to go out and, and look. Uh, we would have drastically um, lost revenues that, that we desperately need. Now, if we were a state that ranks um, in the top five and not the bottom five, that may not have been a huge um, motivating factor for me. Um, but for a state that continues to find itself um, ranking in the bottom, I don't think it's proven for us to throw away um, an opportunity to, to raise millions and millions of dollars, especially for um, you know, a problem that, that does not seek to exist in Louisiana. We didn't hear from not a single coach, not a single parent, not a single athlete um, that had been um, burdened by this particular issue. And we also knew that the High School Athletic Association already has um, rules that basically seeks to address what this bill sought to rectify in our great state. Um, we have traditionally held that um, the Louisiana High School Athletic Association, uh, while I think we should probably have some legislative oversight, we don't. And in past um, issues when we've tried to regulate them, we've been quickly reminded that the LHSAA is a private entity and that the legislature shouldn't um, get involved in, in those practices. Uh, for me, if we're going to open it up for one issue, I would say let's open it up and get more legislative oversight and put some members of the legislature um, on that body um, now because I see a lot of different issues with um, that organization with how they handle um, certain things in our community. Um, that's not what I'm here to talk about today, but uh, for me, it was a, a growing practice that we did not involve ourselves in um, the workings of the LHSA. Another thing that, that came up with this bill, um, there was a large number of members of the Black Caucus that, that were absent um, that day on that bill. Um, many of you that follow the process, you know that sometimes those, those absences are um, strategic. Um, on that day when we were voting for that bill, there was a huge protest on the state capitol for the, the family of Ronald Green. Uh, many of you know that the Black Caucus has been very um, engaged in the conversations with state police and with the, the Ronald Green family. So I will tell you that, that I can speak um, frankly and honestly and clearly that um, those members that, that were absent, a large percentage of those members were on the steps of the Louisiana State Capitol at the time, and I don't think those members were, were dodging votes. Um, but the bill was vetoed, and of course, um, in my opinion, I think that the Speaker hastily called us into a veto session. Um, and he stood before you and promised that, that he was 100% sure um, that the bills were going to, you know, 
ultimately be overridden. Um, I will tell you that, that there were times when I thought that he was right. Um, I thought that if the bill made it to the House, that the bill will ultimately become law. And over my years in the legislature, and, and my former colleague, uh, Rob Shadowin, is here, we have grown accustomed to the, the Senate doing the majority of the work. Uh, we have consistently said, okay, let the bill get to the Senate, and they're they the more mature group. Um, they'll figure it out. Right, Rob? <laughs> that, that has been, been a practice, and, and unfortunately, um, that causes folks to you know, possibly vote for a bill just to, to, to show some constituency group that they may have been supportive when they really didn't want to because we had confidence in the Senate that they would fix the budget, that um, they would kill some of these bad bills. Uh, what we didn't realize is that a lot of folks that were on the House side are now in the Senate, right, Rob? Uh, and, and now the, the House can't just rely on the Senate to, to do the lion's share of the work. Um, so I will be honest with you that there were times that I um, thought that the, the Speaker was right. The day that we pulled up for the veto session, and I think the, our Attorney General, he, he made it plainly clear it had nothing to do about the bill. This was all about, as, as he stated, putting the Democratic Party and the governor on trial. Um, we pulled up at the Capitol in, in strategy meetings. They pulled up and had a pit rally. Mm -hmm. um, the, the chairman of the delegation had a life, it wasn't even a life size, a huge elephant in, in the parking lot. And I think that some of those things um, hurt them in the long run. I think that some of the members that, that may have been on the fence, uh, when they saw those types of, of demonstrations, um, they quickly learned that this was, was more about a show and less about actually addressing a real issue that would have um, impacted young people in our state. Many people have said, oh, you have a daughter. Um, if, if, if you don't think this is important for, for your daughter, then at least think it's, it's important for mine. Um, I can go through a, a litany of issues that are important for not just my daughter, but all daughters across the state of Louisiana that we've ignored. Um, and until we start igno not ignoring those things and take a holistic and, and have a, a real appreciation and move the needle for things of, of impact in women in our great state, um, let's not start with a, a bill um, that is not going to solve a, a single issue, that is not going to correct anything, and is frankly going to cost us millions and millions of dollars. And I think that um, I reminded my colleagues on the other side that I stand um, ready to address a lot of the issues facing um, women in our great state. Um, you know, it was no surprise that, and I think that the speaker and, and those are on the other side, um, I don't know why they were so surprised that the Democrats voted that the way that we did. Um, it is known around the Capitol, and it's funny how I, I watch on both sides um, the accusations of, um, you know, arm twisting and uh, threats, um, promises, because I will tell you, they happen all, every single day, <laughs> especially with um, something so um, you know fragile as a veto override. You know, as, as a governor, if I'm a governor, um, I certainly don't want anyone in my party to, to take away uh, you know my veto authority. And, and as a speaker, um, I certainly wouldn't want anyone in, in my party to, to go against me when I've uh, made a statement that I'm 100% um, you know convinced and confident that something is going to happen. Um, so I will tell you that, um, and I don't know him personally because, you know, the governor didn't have to ask me and, and the speaker, um, he and I are respectful enough that, that he knew not to threaten me and, and he wouldn't even put me in a position because we are good friends. And I will, will, will tell people that, um, you know, until my term ends, um, Clay Shakespeare is, is the right person to be our speaker. I am utterly disappointed in him now, um, but I know that from day one, um, the people that have called for him to remove me and other Democrats were not the people that wanted him to be the speaker. Um, and I have been quoted several times as saying that I'm confident that the speaker is going to um, listen to those in his family. I, I get in trouble for, for saying the family. I end up um, on certain blogs because I, I mentioned the, the word family. Um, but that, that is what I think is important because in the family, Sarah was my cousin. Uh, you know, in the family, you're not always going to agree, but you will always be there to support that person. And, and I will stand on my comments and I will tell you that um, the, the folks that elected him have been more of a family um, to the speaker than, than some of the folks that are asking for him to, to get rid of all of the Democrats. Um, and, and I hate that, that you guys um, and those folks out there in the blog world don't uh, want to respect that as truth, but it is. 
Um, so we rallied behind to support the governor and protect his veto and the, the speaker's decision to remove um, two Democratic chairmen and um, two other uh, members, I think, was, was the wrong move because not a single thing that the speaker has wanted to do uh, has been accomplished without the support of Democrats. Um, his tax reform bills would not have passed. Um, a lot of the issues regarding um, transportation, they would not have passed um, when there were those folks on his side that wanted to vote no and he needed um, the Democrats. And I think that it, it threatens all of the good things that I mentioned that happened during um, the regular session because I know that, that there um, are some hurt feelings out there and understandably so. Um, I know that for me, um, whatever the, the, the speaker decides to do with, with my chairmanship, I, I can accept it and I, I will continue to, to move in, in the, the fashion that I've always moved. Uh, you know, I'll have to walk a, a, a longer way from my parking spot to get in the building, but it, it, it won't remove my, my status as a state rep for District 101, and it's not going to silence me, and I would suggest to you that it's not going to silence Chad Brown, Vincent Pierre, um, or C. Travis Johnson in that um, I think now um, they are more motivated to work towards making sure that then we don't find ourselves in this situation again. And when I say this situation, um, this veto override session um, was so close and the numbers were so close, not because of actions taken this year or actions taken last year. Um, the, the votes were so close because of actions taken um, the last time we drew legislative maps. Uh, and we drew maps that don't, that quite frankly, don't look like Louisiana. And of course, you might say, oh, well, of course, you're a Democrat, um, you're in a minority, so of course you're going to say this. Um, but when I look at my colleagues like Tanner McGee, who represents a, a district that is fairly balanced, you get fair representation out of him. You get someone that is bipartisan. You get someone um, that's not just going to say no, you're going to get someone that says, I don't agree with this, but I get, agree with these three points. Let's try to work to see if we can get to the middle. Um, so if we had not failed in drawing fair maps, and, and a lot of it is, and I've always been honest about it, um, some of the, the issues started with the caucus that I lead now. Um, because I think that way too often we've been concerned with creating districts that are 90% African American, 90% Democratic, and what happens is when you rep if I represented a district that was 90% Democratic, the 10% of my Republican, I wouldn't even ret return their phone calls. Um, and that's, wait, not you. I will return your phone call. Uh, but, but in essence, that, that's what happens when, when you create these districts that are so lopsided. You actually silence a huge part of your constituency. So, and I pick on Tanner a lot, and Tanner gets in trouble because I called him my friend, and people don't think that, that he should be my friend. But um, Tanner is, you know, I know that he's a good guy, um, but he's forced to be a good guy because of the way his district was drawn. Um, and for us, we knew that, that this veto override session was not about the transgender bill, was not about the gun bill, it was about redistricting. It was about whether or not um, my colleagues on the other side knew that they could override the governor's veto. Right now, I believe that our caucus um, is more unified than we've ever been. Um, and we didn't need this veto session for us to be unified. We didn't need um, to go in and successfully sustain the governor's veto for us to be unified. Um, if you watch the Capitol, when big things happen, you see folks jump up, you see people clapping their hands, you see people high-fiving. We didn't do that. Uh, we basically you know, score a touchdown and you don't need to spike and dance. You just hand the ball to the referee and keep going. And that's what we did as a caucus. And I think that after, uh, while many folks were asking for us to be removed and making these accusations that the Black Caucus has already made the deal to uh, wipe out the, the districts that are represented by rural Democrats, while those articles and those blogs were being posted, we were in the room at the Capitol strategizing with a demographer about redistricting. Um, so for our side, we are in lockstep. And the white Democrats, the rural Democrats, and, and the black caucus, we understand that we cannot accomplish anything solely with our individual caucuses. So um, I don't care how many times it appears in the blog, um, as the chairman of the Black Caucus, I will tell you that we um, know and understand that we cannot be successful uh, without um, our rural Democrats. And quite frankly, we can't be successful without um, some of the Republicans that we've been able to work with. Uh, for us in Baton Rouge, uh, what I have really tried to stress is the importance of us looking forward to redistricting, not as a party, not as a race, but as a region. 
quite frankly, we have been out politicked by our folks down I 10 because they have learned um, to be real organized, they have learned to be real unified in matters at the state capitol. We haven't done that in Baton Rouge. We take all of our local fights, be it brick, right, be it the council on aging, uh, be it St. George versus Baton Rouge, we take all of those local fights and we bring them to the capitol and we're distracted from the, the, the larger picture. Um, and right now, my conversations with, with Paula and Scott and Barbara are in that let's lead those matters. We could fight after redistricting session, right? I promise you, I'll, I'll stand ready to fight with you. Um, but for redistricting, we need to be unified as a capital region because, quite frankly, I'm tired of being all politics by my colleagues in New Orleans. I'm tired of seeing the majority of um, the projects go down to New Orleans. I'm tired of seeing the majority of our representation shifted down to New Orleans. And I love my folks in New Orleans. My district is 101. It is a former district of New Orleans. Um, and you know, honestly, as we look at the numbers, I know that my district lost. Uh, my district was created because of the population that was lost in New Orleans. Right now, we have a population lost in Baton Rouge because of the flood. So the irony is that you know your district was created because of a huge hurricane, and now um, you've lost population, not to the point where we think we're going to lose a seat. Um, but we need to be, um, and I'm going to ask each and every one of you, I know that there are probably things that I've said today that, that you disagree with, and that's, that's perfectly fine. I know that um, I'm probably going to vote a, a way that, that you wouldn't vote in the future. Um, but I hope that you agree that for us as a region, uh, we should be more focused on increasing the representation um, here in Baton Rouge, not just in the legislature, um, but in Congress. Um, our district shouldn't be shared with New Orleans on the Public Service Commission. Our district shouldn't be shared with New Orleans on the Supreme Court. I think we'll rightfully do um, another seat that encompasses, that encompasses um, Baton Rouge. And that will be um, the focus of um, my um, experience or, or my outlook in, in the redistricting session and quite frankly um, that's going to be the, the push of the caucus because we, we recognize how important it is just to maximize um, our representation and I hope that, that you all will agree that it's important um, as we move forward that we at least try to, to do more for a region um, here in Baton Rouge and, and that is one of the things that is really uh, frustrating about Vincent Pierre losing his chairmanship because of the relationship um, that he has with the federal government um, and a lot of the, the work that he was already doing that now is going to be interrupted um, in this change of leadership. And, and we know that um, the, with, with the administration that we have now, we have so many people uh, that have relationships with those folks and him losing um, their chairmanship of such a vital um, committee, transportation. We're not gonna get somebody from Ben Rouge to, to chair that committee. Um, so now that the attention that we've been able to, to grab uh, from Vincent because he's a friend of Baton Rouge, now that's going to be lost um, in that I'm telling you today that the, the next person that's going to chair the committee is not going to be someone that's going to be worried about making sure that, that we get that bridge. Um, now before I, I open it up for questions, that, that infrastructure bill, um, I didn't vote for it. And, and I will tell you as much as I want to see a, a new bridge um, in Baton Rouge, I didn't vote for it for several reasons. Um, number one, uh, because I don't want a future legislature to have to do what we did in um, rebounding from a, a, a huge fiscal cliff. Um, it was extremely hard to get us um, out of the red into um, the situation that we find ourselves in now. And even though I'm going to be gone, I don't want the folks coming behind me to have to go through that. The second thing is those projects, just as quick as they were added into those bills, those projects can be removed. Um, so there's no certainty that those projects are, are going to remain. And then the third reason, um, the other two are very serious. This one is, is serious to me, but you might think it's kind of humorous. Um, you know, there, there have been several times when uh, myself and Rob uh, and other members of the legislature have, have voted for, for revenue um, to make sure that we have vital projects here in Baton Rouge, PQ Lane. Um, and I would get aggravated when I would see the folks that voted no outside taking pictures with their thumbs up with a sign like they actually did something to make sure that PQ Lane is a project. So I will tell you if I'm wrong, and if we do get a bridge for that bill, I will be outside taking a picture with my thumb up, taking credit like my colleagues have done in the past. Uh, so, so that is my third reason for not voting for the bill because I was tired of you know carrying the load while other folks went and take the picture. So at some point, Jim and those of you heard it here first. If the bridge comes, I will be out there with my thumb up, even though I voted against the bill. Um, thank you for your time, and I know that we have some questions. Yes, sir. You mentioned the Ronald Green protest. Yes. Last week it was reported in the Associated Press 
that Lieutenant, uh, Louisiana State Police Colonel Lamar Davis traveled up to on the day after the video was released. He traveled up to Monroe to try to convince District Attorney John Belton <coughs> not to pursue criminal yeah. charges against those troopers. Do you believe it's time for Colonel Davis to resign? I don't, not yet. And I'll tell you that um, I've had conversations with, with both the DA, the Colonel, and other members, and I've been told that that part is not true. Um, I have, you know, some, some very personal feelings about this whole thing, and I'm extremely disappointed in the state police. But on that piece, um, I believe what I, what I was told that, that that's not what happened. In that meeting. Okay, thank and you. I hope I, that I'm not proved wrong later. On. <laughs> thank you. Yes, ma'am. Redistricting and that the talks have already begun around that. Are there any particular areas that uh, you know your group is focusing on and hoping to kind of redraw based on how our populations really change? Well, I'll tell you that I think that uh, Baton Rouge deserves a, a, another congressional district. I'll tell you that um, I believe that in the state with the African American population that we have, um, that we shouldn't just have one um, seat in Congress. We shouldn't just have um, one seat on the Supreme Court, nor um, the one seat on the Public Service Commission. I think that the number dictate that uh, we have uh, more districts where you know Democrats can at least make the candidate a choice and that, that's going to be um, our motivating factor. How do you think the sixth district should be? Um, so the, the maps that I, I'm looking at two different maps right now so and I, and I don't want to, to put that out there yet um, but I, I think that the sixth congressional district should at least have the entire parish and we shouldn't share with, with the second congressional mm -hmm. Yes ma'am. Um, it sounds like y'all are going to take a different approach this time. Is that a position on behalf of the full caucus, or is that your perspective? No, that, 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 is, that is the position of the entire caucus. And, um, you know, as I stated before, um, there have been so many issues. I think that those folks that, that made those deals to create the current maps, um, they didn't have to go through the battles that we've had to go through. So the, the members that um, actually represent those districts that are packed, um, they, they have been the first ones to, to recognize that um, they're going to have to lose, you know, some, some population or some neighborhoods that um, they're used to representing. So it, it is a, a unified um, approach that we're taking. I know we're waiting for the census data to come out in the next week or so, but do you feel that both Democratic or Republican uh, districts, do you feel that there's any seats that may be in jeopardy through this? There are some. No. Yeah, there are some. I mean, you know, and, and there there are, you know, it's politics, right? And you cannot, um, you can't be in politics and then complain when things get political, right? Um, so, um, like for me, I'm term limited. So, um, normally, as a term limited legislator, you know, I I, I, I can't go in and, and, and flex like, you know, most folks. I mean, I am, but traditionally, those term limited legislators have been the ones that have had to, uh, be more giving because they're not going to be there. Um, that's not going to be the approach that I'm going to take. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, that's why these, these removals ha are so important uh, because for me, I think that it, it further helps us to protect um, the, the potential override if the governor decides to, to veto a map. Um, because for me, if, if, if I'm clearly showing you, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to punish you, that pushes folks to our side, right? Um, and I think that, unfortunately, what happened with the veto override session is, this is all about 70. It has nothing to do with transgender. It has nothing to do with guns. It's about 70. Um, they are no closer to 70 than they were before the session. And I think that removing those members took them a little further away from 70. Yes, sir. You said that um, um, the speaker is the right person for the job, but you're utterly disappointed in it right now. Does that mean that the coalition that helped get Play elected, including with a lot of type support, is intact, even though the, the uh, removal of the people from committees. Yeah, you know, I, I think that we have a lot of tough conversations ahead. Um, I have never, um, even though it's been reported, I, I'm not going to even call these reports um, because these blogs aren't really um, news outlets. Um, we have never, as a caucus, um, tried to remove the speaker or even suggest it. Now I have a litany of text messages from colleagues on the other side um, that have. Um, so for us, we have, we have not done that. And I think that 
um, you know, while the, the relationship is frayed, um, I, I don't think that it's at the point where I, I think that it's going to be just totally disbanded. Um, but we do have some, some making up to do. Yes, ma'am. particularly on the Republican side, is a discussion that because Democrats had voted for the bills but then refused to vote for the veto override, that that inherently made things more partisan going forward because those Democrats didn't vote the policy, they voted with the governor <coughs> instead. So what are your thoughts on whether that veto session will now inherently make the House more partisan in some fashion? The Democrats didn't ask for the veto session. Right, um, the, the speaker made the house more partisan when he when he made us go back there, um, and you know for us I think that not only the speaker asking us to go that go back, but the pep rally that um, ensued. Uh, now for me I, I get I get charged with it as well um, because some folks don't like my tweets, um, and and I'm the bad guy, uh, but I didn't ask to go into the veto session, and for us there was nothing that changed. Like we have been lockstep. Um, Every single uh, part of this process, we were lockstep in, in um, making Clay Speaker Shakes night, and we were lockstep in um, these these tax reforms. So um, I don't know why it was such a big shock for my colleagues on the other side uh, that that we uh, and this this had nothing to do with the governor. And uh, again, I will say this, and I, I said it to him. You know, yes, of course, as a governor, you don't want your bill your veto overridden. This was about not John Bell, this was not about Ted, this was about maps for the next 10 to 15 years. So um, to keep saying that we were just trying to protect the governor is absolutely false. We knew that this was a test um, to be able to override his decision to veto maps that weren't fair. So this had absolutely nothing to do with him and more about the maps moving forward and, and how districts are going to look. Um, I, I am happy uh, that Clay is finally now getting the support from the people that should have supported him day one. If they had a support of him day one, we probably wouldn't have five Democratic chairmanships. So I'm happy that he's now invited to, you know, he's not at the kitty table, he's at the big family table now. Um, and, and hopefully they, they continue to be friends with him and not call him wrong way Clay and all these other things. So because we haven't done that. I, I've told you I've called him my friend and every time I've been asked um, a statement about him, I'm, I remind people that, that he's the right person for the job. How much sway does Gene Bill have? Unfortunately, too much. Um, I, I think that um, you know when I, I have witnessed and I have I have talked to members, especially in my committee. I've talked to members that, that have wanted to vote a certain way, but you know when he shows up, they, they vote an opposite way. Um, you know, and that's part of the process, right? Um, I, I heard that they wanted me removed as as, as chairman of. Uh, Criminal justice, and I'm always so nice to him, so it hurt, it hurt my feelings a little bit because I'm always nice to him when he comes to the committee. Uh, but you know, unfortunately, he, he has a lot of sway. How do you feel about the mandating of the vaccine, and what role, if any, should the state legislature have in that going forward? You know, my, my I think any COVID question for me is so personal. Um, so Ted thinks that that we should have a, a vaccine mandate. Um, you know, Representative James knows that that's never going to happen. Right, um, and you know, I think that if LSU football said they're going to require a vaccine, our problems are solved. <laughs> Here, our problems are solved, uh, and uh, we have seen, unfortunately, that um, this pandemic has been made so political, and that is, is just it, it has been most one of the most difficult and disappointing things because we literally lost a colleague. I literally spent five days in the hospital. Other members that have not been so public spend days in the hospital and, and we go back and in this rush um, to you know go back to session when we were still under a stay at home order and, and this is this is going to be you know might may be unpopular but I will tell you if the death toll last year um, in the African American community um, was here and the death toll in, in the white community would have been here, we would have never gone back to session. Period. Right? So Largely, that was something that still upsets me to this day um, because I think that there was this, this ignorance and that, oh, this is not happening in my community, so let's rush back. Because I go to different restaurants all the time and you, you, you see all these open seats, but they don't have the staff there because people are, you know, and a lot of folks say, oh, well, people are just at home getting unemployment. 
I think that that's embarrassing that in our state that you would make more on unemployment than you would make in wages. That is embarrassing to me um, as, as a state. Um, but I know because I, I, I frequent some of these places and, and they tell me we don't have the, the people because people are fearful. People don't want to go and risk themselves getting sick because other folks aren't, aren't getting vaccinated. But I, I just know that that's not going to happen. Um, and, and honestly, I don't know if we can afford it as a state. I don't know if we can afford another shutdown. Although I, I kind of wish the governor was just like completely shut it down until football season so we can have some normalcy. But, you know, he's not going to do that. One more question. Good. Thank you. Thank you.